It's Vegan Freak Radio number 94 for the 20th of June, 2008. Coming to you from high atop their elite fortress of moral superiority, here are your protein-deficient hosts, Bob and Jenna. Hey everybody, how are you? This is Bob. And Jenna. And we're back again for another week of Vegan Freak Radio. Today on the show, we have for you a special show. We have an interview. We haven't done an interview in a while. And this interview with Gary Francione on the topic of his new book, which we'll talk about in a, in a moment. And uh, what we're going to do is cut it across two weeks. Yeah, it was a long interview, so rather than give you the whole thing at once, we'll split it in two. Yeah, I think we'll come out with the next part probably early next week, Tuesday, Wednesday, somewhere in there. Yeah. With the second half. We're going to run the first hour today of the interview. And during the interview, we talk with Gary about his new book. We talk um, with him about the distinctions between wealth, new, new welfareism and abolitionism. What else? Yeah, we basically hit on most of the major topics that he covers in his book. We talk about... I forget what we talked about in the first hour. Uh oh. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> it was only yesterday. My mind is failing me. <laughs> well. My protein deficient veganism. Yeah, really. <laughs> You're just getting old. So. Yeah, that could be it. But yeah, so uh, that's what we're going to do. We're going to split it into two halves. Um, so hang in there and listen in and get out your pen and pencil because often these are the, you know, often our interviews with Gary are, are the ones that people find most useful for conceptualizing a lot of the real difficulties and challenges in the animal rights movement. So this is the this is the interview to pay attention to. Exactly. So with that, we'll just get rolling with the interview, and we'll be back when the interview's done. All right. Well, it is our great pleasure to be here with Gary L. Francione, yet again on Vegan Freak Radio. Gary's been with us many times in the past, and many of you, when we ask, what do you want back on the show, a lot of you say, Gary. So here we are with Gary. In case you don't know who Gary is, you should know if you don't. But in case you don't know, Gary L. Francione was the first academic to teach animal rights theory in an American law school, and he has lectured on the topic throughout the United States, Canada, and Europe. He is Distinguished Professor of Law and Nicholas D. B. Katzenbach Scholar of Law and Philosophy at Rutgers University, Newark, and his books include Introduction to Animal Rights and Animals, Property, and the Law. Gary is joining us today to talk about his new book, which is just a brilliant volume, actually. I think it's a really nice kind of capstone to his, to his thoughts in some ways, but I, I hope it's not a capstone. I hope that there's more after this. But his new book is called Animals as Persons, Essays on the Abolition of Animal Exploitation. Welcome to Vegan Freak Radio, Gary. Hi, Bob. Hi, John. It's great to be back. And let me allay your fears. I'm actually working on another book uh, and was working on it right before you called. <laughs> Man, you, Good to hear. Uh, you are a workaholic. Yes, well... Man with a mission. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So, uh, what I was wondering is maybe you could, uh, we could begin by you telling us a little bit about kind of the, where this book is going and uh, kind of wrapping, you know, giving us a little summary for it for people who don't, aren't familiar with it yet. Well, it's a series of essays. Um, uh, there are seven essays in the book, and five of them are recent essays. Uh, two are older essays. Um, and and what, they, what they deal with, they, they deal with... Um, Issues like, uh, you know, I, I took a look at animal welfare development over the past, you know, dozen years or so since I wrote Animals, Property, and the Law and Rain Without Thunder. And I looked, you know, I looked at animal welfare regulation to see if anything had changed, to see if, if, if animals were indeed getting more protection. Because, you know, when I wrote, when I wrote Animals, Property, and the Law and Rain Without Thunder, which, were, which I did in 1995 and 96 respectively, People who disagreed with me said, well, you know, yes, we agree that there's a problem with animals being property, but that doesn't mean we can't give them significant protection. We just have to do better, and we have to give them more protection. But the fact, the very fact that they're property doesn't mean that we, could, we, know, we can't give them more protection. Now, of course, I never, I never said we can't give them more protection. What I said was because animals are economic commodities, it's, it's difficult to give them more protection because of that commodity status, because basically to give animals protection, more protection you have to purchase more protection and 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 that in essence adds to your your you know the cost of the production of animal products and if people aren't willing to 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 bear that cost um, and if it's going to result in demand 
changing and in revenues being lost, then producers aren't going to be interested in it, and and consumers aren't going to be interested if they're going to have to pay more money. There will always be some people who will pay more, you know, affluent people who will pay more uh, so that they can make their, you know, they can ease their consciences um, and 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 feel that they're, you know, that they're eating happy meat or whatever. But by and large, people aren't, you know, most people aren't really going to be willing to do that. So, so, um, but what I did was I took a look at the past, you know, tw- you know, dozen years or whatever since I wrote those books to look at the legislation and the industry changes that had happened to see whether or not they fit my paradigm or didn't fit my paradigm. And what I conclude in one of the longer essays in the book is that it fits the paradigm. You know, all, everything that's happened actually fits exactly uh, what I was saying in 95 and 96, and that is that animal welfare reform is very, very limited, does not provide much protection, and, the, and, and, and it's limited by efficient exploitation. That is, we protect animal interests only to the extent that it's economically beneficial for us to do so. And and um, and that's it. That's it. That's basically the the limiting principle of animal welfare. It's not the necessarily limiting principle, but it is because of the status of animals as economic commodities. It is the principle which matters on the ground. It's the practical principle that does limit this stuff. And so I went into a you know I, I analyzed that. I also I also um, explored the development of animal welfare theory. Uh, and and in, in a couple of the essays, um, uh, and and um, I, by that what I mean is, in the 19th century, when animal welfare theory uh, uh, developed first in Britain and then in the United States, it was based on the idea that well, yes, you know, we've been wrong to exclude animals from the moral community because animals can suffer, so therefore, um, you know, they, they they have to matter morally. Uh, but we have to remember something, and that is that Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill and those people who were sort of the the, the founders of the animal welfare movement, or the, the the whole idea the whole idea of animal welfare, and the people who promoted it legally, um, the fact that they thought that animals suffered and therefore mattered morally, and that they should receive legal protection, didn't mean that they thought that animals and humans, that non-humans and humans, were the same. Um, Bentham and Mill thought that there were very significant differences between humans and non-humans, and they did not think that animal life had the same moral value as human life, which led both of them and basically the entire animal welfare movement to the conclusion that it was okay that we used animals. The problem was how we used animals. And and um, so the welfare movement was was founded on the idea that animals had less moral value. The animal life had less moral. Their suffering mattered, but their lives didn't. Mm -hmm. So animal life had less moral value than human life. It was all right for us to use animals as long as we treated them well, because their lives didn't matter. They they, they didn't have the same sorts of minds that we had. They didn't care about whether we killed them. They just cared about how we killed them and how we used them while they were alive. And and, um, so I, I, I... got into that and sort of discussed the historical developments of welfare theory. And what I, what I wanted to do and what I did in, in, in a couple of the essays in the book is sort of show how that's linked with contemporary welfare theory. It's, it's that sort of thinking that leads people like Singer to say, well, animals don't have a life. Uh, they, don't have, they, they can't grasp that they have a life in the same way that we do. And Singer actually says in Animal Liberation that... Um, that animals can suffer, and the fact that you know that an animal can suffer, uh, the, the, the animal suffering shouldn't be discounted simply because of species, but because animals are not, according to Singer, uh, self-aware, or because they don't have the same sorts of minds that that the humans have, it, it's all it, you know those those cognitive differences matter to the value of life. And it's what leads Singer to say that, you know, well, we can be conscientious omnivores as long as we <laughs> are careful to make sure that we, you know, that, that, that we, we eat animals that have a relatively pleasant life and a, and a you know, relatively painless death and things like that. Well, that's unsurprising, um, right? Because you, you've said in the past that, that Singer is um, Bentham's modern proponent. You know, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, and, 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 you know, one of the reasons why I got into this issue was, 
when I wrote um, Introduction to Animal Rights in 2000, uh, and I made, you know, and I, I have that, that chapter in which I talk about Bentham and Singer, and I talk about, you know, the similarities and how, you know, w- w- where I think both of them went wrong. I got a really a tremendous reaction from that in terms of um, both people being very interested and also people coming back and, you know, and saying, you know, I mean, the welfare movement, which is very much sort of a, a, a cult around Singer, um, very, very upset in saying, you know, how can you, you know, how can you say that Singer doesn't care, you know, doesn't, doesn't think that, you know, killing animals raises a moral issue. And, and so I wanted to get into, um, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to explore that further, which I do in a couple of essays in this book. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's very clear, and I now understand um, better than I ever have, really, where Singer's coming from, um, both both, both from his contemporary, you know, in terms of his contemporary thinking, but also historically where those ideas came from, you know, and, and, and the fact that, you know, you have people like um, Mill and Bentham saying, you know, it, it, animals, animals have different minds, and because they have different minds, it's okay that we use them. We just have to be kind to them when we use them, which is really, I mean, the philosophical foundation of the welfare movement. So I get into that. Um, uh, one of the essays deals with ecofeminism. Uh, and and uh, the notion that that the ethic of care, the feminist ethic of care, goes beyond animal rights, which I dispute and say no, it doesn't. Um, it, it, that the ethic of care is in, in essence what I argue in this particular essay is that it, it's a it's a consequentialist theory, very very similar to utilitarianism. It requires that we 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 accord more weight to animal interests, but it's it doesn't really go beyond animal rights by no means. Um, one of the other essays deals with a significant difference I have uh, with Tom Reagan. Reagan actually likes Singer. Um, it, in, in, in the case for animal rights, um, Reagan talks about the problem of the dog and the lifeboat. And he says, you know, if you're on, if you're on the lifeboat and you've got a human and you've got a dog, that you, you 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 should get you should throw the dog over because um, for a dog death is a harm, but it's not as great a harm as it is for a human. So 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 Reagan departs from Singer in that he acknowledges clearly that death is a harm for the dog, but he's somewhat like um, Singer and very very much like Mill. Uh, John Stuart Mill, when he says, well, you know, that the opportunities for satisfaction for a dog are much more limited than the opportunities for satisfaction for a human. And, and um, I think that that idea, uh, as a matter of fact, what, Tom's, what, what, what Reagan says in the book is that if you have a human being sitting on the boat and a million dogs, you should throw the million dogs overboard because the harm of death for the human is 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 qualitatively different than it is for any of the dogs. So um, you know, since since all of the one million dogs will be harmed much less than the human will, then you know we ought to get rid of the one million dogs. We ought we ought to throw the one million dogs overboard. Now, of course, it would have to be very large lifeboats that have a million <laughs> dogs. And, but 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 it's not a question of numbers for him. And oh. and um. So and, and and actually, I don't know whether he actually says a million dogs or whether he he just gives another high, a high number. But the point is, it doesn't really matter what the number is because he thinks that death is 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 a greater harm for humans than for non-humans. So therefore, when we're in the situation where we have to choose, we ought to choose the 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 non-human because humans have much more uh, have many more opportunities for satisfaction, which strikes me as being just you know outright. Speciesism, because I mean, you know, I, I, I'm sitting here right now and I'm looking at my my border collie, with whom I am pictured on the in the jacket of the Columbia <laughs> book. A very cute uh, picture, look, by the I'm way. I'm looking at Katie Jane right now, and uh, you know, uh, can I say that I have more opportunities for satisfaction than she does? Well, and you the know, answer is I'm not really sure I could say that. I'm not sure how relevant it would be anyway, but I certainly don't think, as an empirical matter, we can say that that humans have greater opportunities for satisfaction. And this, again, you know, this goes back to, this goes back to things like John Stuart Mill 
um, you know, writing in the in the nineteenth century that well, because humans are able to engage in intellectual, you know, we can sit around and have intellectual discussions like we're having right now, uh, but we can sit around and have intellectual discussions, and that, that gives us much more pleasure than the pleasure that animals feel. And the answer is, well, like. You know, <laughs> who says, John Stuart Mill? Um, I completely and, agree. And, I mean, yeah. every night when we eat dinner, right? Every night when we eat dinner, yeah. we give we give our dogs a treat, uh, and uh, the enjoyment that that our dogs get from this simple treat we give them every night, to me, is so complete and so thorough. And I can tell that it is complete and thorough for them in a way that it probably isn't complete and thorough for me if I if I get a treat. Um, and I, I find that, that that's why I, I agree with you with you fully here I and mean, i find that's a very troubling way to compare and to make these moral choices well you know it's 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 interesting and you know one of the things i discuss in the book is it really is interesting how these ideas these crazy ideas that we have about animals don't care about their lives or they don't have a sense of you know they, they don't they don't care that we use them they only care how we use them or animals don't have as many opportunities for satisfaction as we have these ideas are so deeply ingrained in our species little pea brain <laughs> um that that they even permeate people like Singer and Reagan and others, you know, who who, who are animal ethicists or, or 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 put themselves forward as animal ethicists and put themselves forward as people who oppose speciesism. But yet, there's really no way that you can that you can justify these ideas except in terms of species discrimination. I mean, just outright discrimination based on species, which leads you to conclusions, empirical conclusions about you know how what, what these animals value and what they don't value. They're just just nuts and totally mm-hmm. arbitrary. And I agree with you. I mean, I, you know, we take the dogs out now that the weather's warm. We like we, we're getting up early in the morning and taking them out for a walk so that you know they don't bake if we take them out at, <laughs> at twelve o'clock. And um, and, you know, when we were walking around this morning, I said to Anna, um, you know, it, because the dogs, you know, they like to they like to stop at every tree and look <laughs> up and look at the birds and look at the squirrels. And it's clear that they're totally engaged and they're totally enjoying themselves mm-hmm. in a way that, um, you know, now do I en- enjoy myself as much as they do? I don't know. But the one thing I can say with certainty is that I don't know with certainty <laughs> and that it's certainly an open question in my mind. So that I could never say that um, humans have greater opportunities for satisfaction because we can sit around and read books or play on the internet or or do whatever it is what we do that we find satisfying. Um, y- y- you know that that I can say that 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 represents some sort of qualitatively greater degree of enjoyment. I just don't. I, I just think that's nuts. Well, I agree with you. You're you're making it. Um you're an interesting person to interview because I have all these questions and I think you just hit like four of them in the last, in the, <laughs> in the last few minutes. So, um, it, it, that's, it's pretty cool. Uh, I kind of want to change gears for a second to make sure I just want to okay. make things clear because, um, in, in a lot of ways, I think one of the things that, that continues to perplex people, I mean, even though we've talked about it repeatedly on our show and you've mm-hmm. written about it and I've written about it is this distinction between new welfareism and abolitionism. And one of the things I very commonly hear is, is this kind of like, you know, uh, not Rodney King, but you know, remember this? Why can't we all just get along, right? After the Rodney, wasn't that after the Rodney King meetings, mm-hmm. yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So why can't we all just get along? I keep hearing this kind of thing where people think, okay, that ultimately new welfareism and abolitionism, you know, this is a false dichotomy. That ultimately we're fighting for the same thing, and that we're taking sides. We're fracturing the movement into camps. It's all wrongheaded. And in your book, I think you do a very nice job. In all of your books, actually, but in this in this latest book, I think you do a really nice job. Uh, reflecting on the main insights that you've developed in your other two books, Rain Without Thunder, Animals, Property, and the Law, and things like that. So I'm wondering, maybe you could talk about why this this distinction between new welfareism and abolition, abolitionism is not a false dichotomy. I mean, why this is an important distinction and why it is one that matters. Well, first of all, new welfareism, um, when I first used that term uh, in, in uh, 95 or 96, whenever I wrote that book, um, it rang without thunder. I was using it um, to refer primarily to people who took the position that it was wrong to use animals at all and that we ought to abolish all animal use, but that the only way we could do that, or the, 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 the most effective way we could do that, was to regulate, 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 and then eventually one day we would achieve abolition. Um, I would expand, and I, I actually did in Rain Without Thunder, 
talk about it in different contexts, but, but contexts, but now I'm more explicit about it. New welfareists are people who either believe that welfare regulation is going to lead to abolition in the future, or that welfare regulation is going to lead to um, significant changes in how we treat animals until we get, you know, it, until we get to some future point, and re- will reduce animal use. Um, in, in other words, we'll, you, you, so so the, the new welfareist can be the person who says that welfare regulation is going to lead to abolition down the line. The new welfareist can also be the person who says that, well, I don't know whether it's going to lead to abolition down the line, and I may not even be in favor of abolition, but I am in favor of animals being treated a lot better, and I'm in, tr- I'm in favor of, of reducing animal use uh, significantly from the point at which it's at now, and I think regulation will do that. Those are related but different arguments, because there are a lot of folks out there who don't really talk about abolition being the, the, the end point. As a matter of fact, there are more now, there are more more quote, animal advocates, unquote, um, now have sort of gotten away from the idea that abolition is the desired end point. Um, and, and so, but, but let me just say that the problem with that is, is just, I mean, it, it, and again, um, it, it's crazy. It's not, it, it, has the, it has the sort, you know, it, it's like saying, well, you know, what happens if there's a, this overweight guy who comes down the chimney at, at Christmas time and puts, you know, gifts in, the, in stockings and stuff? <laughs> It's it, it just not true. It, you know, there's no, there's no, there's no proof of uh, that this is gonna, that this works. As a matter of fact, there's quite a bit of proof it doesn't work. Um, in that welfare regulation does not provide significant protection for animal interests. Uh, number one, number two, there is absolutely no evidence, absolutely none, that that animal that regulating animal exploitation will lead to the abolition of anything. Number one. Number two, there is no evidence that it leads to the significant reduction of use uh, of animal use. I mean, the theory there apparently is, and this is, you know, again, what I read from the welfareists, is that they take the position that, well, by regulating exploitation will make it more, more expensive and thereby decrease demand. And the problem is, is that animal regu- the regulation of animal use doesn't decrease demand because what it does is it increases production efficiency. Right. Let me give you an example to put that in plain English. Look at this incredibly absurd campaign that PETA has <laughs> to get to get poultry producers to ad- adopt the controlled atmosphere killing. You method. just hit another one of our questions. <laughs> okay, well, well, there you go. You see, it's a seamless web, Bob. Um, <laughs> and and um, uh, uh, let's look at that campaign. If you look at the literature that comes out of groups like the Humane Society of the United States and People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, it is, it is focused on the idea that Controlled atmosphere killing will result will 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 will, will uh, require a capital investment to change the equipment over to to provide for gassing the birds, um, and there are different ways of doing that. You can do it in the truck, you can do it at the factory, and things like that. And some are more expensive than others. But the studies show that the producers can recoup the cost in about a year, and their profits go up dramatically in a number of different respects. So, so controlled atmosphere killing, which is the big campaign now, is, is, is something that um, is not going to result in people eating fewer chickens because, because the price is going to go up because of the welfare regulation. The production cost is going to go down. If anything, price will go down. Price is not going to go up. Mm-hmm. And if anything... The one thing we can be certain of is when you have PETA and HSUS and these other organizations praising poultry producers, when you have PETA saying that we have no differences with Kentucky Fried Chicken, what does that (laughs) say to the public? What does that say to the public? What it says is they call the boycott off of, of, of KFC Canada. And they've said we don't have any differences. We don't have any welfare differences. We think we're we think we're concerned. We think that you know they're they're concerned about animal welfare. When you have statements like that coming out, what does that tell people? And it tells people that that um, it's okay to go eat a Kentucky Fried Chicken, mm-hmm. and it it doesn't 
help to say, well, we really think people shouldn't eat chicken at all. But because you haven't convinced, you haven't, you haven't even produced the argument for why people shouldn't be eating chicken. <laughs> what you're doing is saying, for those of you who, you know, who think it's, you know, I mean, you shouldn't do it, but we think that Kentucky Fried Chicken is doing a good job in respecting the welfare of animals. What that does is, to the person who is, is concerned about the issue but doesn't really understand the issue and has a, a family and a job and doesn't really have time to sort of think about this stuff, um, what the message that that gives to that person is go ahead and eat a Kentucky Fried Chicken. So I don't really see how this is leading in the direction of abolition. I don't see how it's, and, and actually uh, I've just been reading this past week, uh, some things coming from people like Bernard Rollin, um, who's out of Colorado, uh, uh, I guess, I, I don't know if he's at Colorado State or University of Colorado, but he's a, he's a big, you know, animal ethics, ethics guy, and he's a, uh, uh, an advisor for one of these welfare groups, and he says, you know, he doesn't think that he can say that, um, controlled atmosphere killing is more humane than, than electrical stunning, uh, mm-hmm. and there are a number of animal welfare scientist types that are used by these animal welfare groups quite a bit who are not willing to say that they even think controlled atmosphere killing is 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 a better situation than electrical stunning but putting that aside to say that to say that this is going to lead in the direction of abolition or that it's going to reduce animal consumption because it's going to increase cost not only is crazy but it's crazy given the literature i mean peta go on the peta website read peta's literature and they've got they've got study after study showing that controlled atmosphere killing increases production efficiency and and, and puts more money in the pocket of the of the poultry producers well, you know, and I, I think oh, i'm sorry I, I look well i looked at modified atmosphere killing for um egg producers actually and it is it is the the recommended way that the united egg producers uh recommends getting rid of quote unquote getting rid of spent hens right so it is something that the industry itself at least in, in egg production and also in poultry production is recognized as as extremely efficient well you know you know with this with this whole controlled atmosphere thing this whole campaign shows it really it really puts the spotlight on the business of animal welfare and the business of these organizations because what they do basically is they they identify practices that are on their way out anyway because i mean it, it, you can Look at the gestation crate campaign. Mm-hmm. Look at the veal crate campaign. Look at the controlled atmosphere killing campaign. Basically, animal agri- intensive animal agriculture was something that developed in the 1950s, basically, in the United States. And um, we are only now uh, beginning to see uh, the inefficiencies of, of, the, of the, the whole intensive agriculture situation. That is... The idea was, when, when, when intensive agriculture first started, was, well, you know, it, 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 the more animals that we can cram into a small space, the more money we'll make. People weren't thinking. The producers were not thinking. The people who developed intensive agriculture weren't thinking, well, you know, we put all these animals together, they're going to they're get stressed, they're going to get sick, there's going to be diseases, there's going to be this. Gonna... People weren't thinking about that. They weren't factoring in the stress because they think of these things as machines. They think of these animals as machines. Mm-hmm. And so they weren't, weren't thinking about the fact that these are sensitive, sentient beings that get stressed out, that get sick, that, get, that, that, you know, that, that cannibalize each other. They weren't thinking about these things. And so... Uh, these inefficiencies are only now coming to light, and 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 you know, and, and Europe is clearly ahead in terms of they've you know they've got more. There's more literature coming out of Europe about the inefficiencies of animal agriculture. It takes a while to get over here. You know, it takes a while to come over here, and and um, but what's happening is the animal organizations are looking at things like gestation crates, which are basically, and were on their way out in terms of the pork industry, because the pork industry was realizing that gestation crates impose all sorts of costs that can be mitigated by giving the animals slightly more space and putting them in a, in a slightly different situation and using the electric sow feeding method, for example. Um, and, and, um, and, you know, the European producers are recognizing this. The European agricultural economists and agricultural scientists are, are publishing papers explaining why alternatives to the gestation crate or why alternatives to the veal crate are cost-effective. 
And eventually, you know, that information, because it's an inefficient industry, the, the whole food industry is very inefficient from an economic standpoint, so that information takes a while to filter into the industry. The industry starts changing. And what happens is you get these organizations, they are looking at practices that are on their way out anyway because they're economically inefficient. So then they go after these org- they go after these they start campaigns to to have happen what's going to happen anyway sooner or later. <laughs> One might even argue and I don't know I mean it's 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 it's, it's interesting. My my intuition tells me that there are probably a number of things that actually get that get delayed, changes that get delayed because the animal people start focusing on something, and it may actually have have the effect of delaying the implementation of what the what the industry is going to do anyway because it sets up a confrontation. But in any event, whether that's I don't know whether that's true or not. I'm just saying intuitively that that strikes me as being something that should be explored. But in any event, whether it does or doesn't, the organizations focus on things. The animal organizations focus on things like gestation crates, veal crates. Um, and and uh, 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 the controlled atmosphere killing issue, what we might want to call being vegans, the low hanging fruit of the of the of, of intensive agriculture, they they campaign you know they campaign against these things, and then you know when the when 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 the when industry agrees to the change, which industry. Which, where you know, it's it's in the interest of industry anyway. Industry goes ahead and and says, yeah, we agree with this change, and then it's a win-win situation. Sure. Because then industry gets to say we really care about animal welfare, and and you know the animal people then you know say we've had a victory. You know, we've had, a, and they all sing Kumbaya, and you have these sorts of, you have these situations like you had with Kentucky Fried Chicken in Canada and PETA, where you have. PETA saying, we think they really care about animal welfare, and you have Kentucky Fried Chicken saying, we stand shoulder to shoulder with the, you know, we really care about these issues, and it really, it, you know, it, 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 it's great PR for the exploiter, and it's great PR for the animal welfare organization, which will then, you know, paper the world with fundraising appeals about, look what we did, this is revolutionary. Right, but it also proves that I mean, you have these victories, and then they stop. It proves that welfareism is the end, not you know, well, not I, abolition. I, I, I agree with you. And, yeah. you know, the, the, the response that you'll get when you raise this with people is, is well, we're not really telling them the truth. That's not, you know, we really want to go further. We really want, you know, to, to um, uh, uh, I, 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 if I'm not mistaken, uh, well, I, I shouldn't say because I don't re- really remember, but it, um, I have a recollection that this was actually stated um, uh, explicitly with respect to uh, the Humane Society of the United States. That really, you know, they have a much more uh, uh, certainly people say on the on the internet because I've seen these things. Uh, whether it's true or not, again, I don't know. But um, but people certainly say on the internet that um, well, HSUS has got a much more radical agenda. <laughs> but they just they're just not upfront about it. They're hiding they, it. They, they're hiding it. And and uh, I mean. <laughs> This is silly. I mean, anybody who, I mean, this is, it's silly. It's just completely silly. I mean, anybody who thinks that, well, you know, um, Shapiro, Paul Shapiro's campaign to, you know, to get colleges to get cage-free eggs, which is, uh, and, and, and promoting cage-free eggs as being a really good alternative and a socially responsible alternative to the, you know, to the conventional battery cage is, is I mean, if you really believe that, that that's not a campaign to spend time on, then we disagree. But, the idea that that that's that, that that's going to get us to abolition, or you know, it's crazy. And I agree with you, Jenna. It it is it's, it it really shows that it's an you know it's an end in itself. Okay. Um, and let me let me mention another campaign that people are all excited about. That is just I, just bewilders me, and that is in 1999, the uh, European Union. There was a directive that came out of the Council of Europe. That said that by 2012, uh, the member na- member states of the European Union had to get rid of the conventional battery cage, and all the animal people, uh, PETA, HSUS, and 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 others, all excited and, uh, because uh, several months ago, um, the European uh, Commission, the, uh, the the EU, said that uh, they weren't going to postpone the the implementation of that directive, that, in fact, by 2012, the battery cage has to be gone. Now, of course, in one sense, that was ceremony, that was, that was uh, 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 silly, because the reality is, 
it will be impossible for all of the member states of the European Union to comply with that by 2012. Given the present level of egg production in conventional batteries, it is impossible, uh, actually, I believe, that the member states will be able to comply by 2012. But putting that aside, what nobody ever talks about is the fact that the directive makes very clear that, um, that producers can satisfy the directive by implementing something called an enriched cage system which is basically a cage system that's a little bit bigger and, and has some, some litter for the, the, the hens to scratch and whatnot. It has perch. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's an enriched cage, basically. And that is one of the... It, 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 in other words, the producers are not required to go cage-free or free-range. Not, not that those alternatives are a hell of a lot better, but they're not even required to do that. The only thing they're, the, 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 they're required to do enriched cages. Enriched cage eggs will cost less than one more euro cent to produce than conventional battery uh, uh, eggs, and and um, and it's basically not going to put the the producers at a cost disadvantage relative to the conventional uh, uh, battery battery eggs. And what I find fascinating is, you have some of these animal organizations have actually put out papers. The Compassion and World Farming in 2002 put out a 27 page report about how enraged, uh, enriched uh, cages were. I mean, they put out this report saying enriched cages are terrible. They said enriched cages are no better than conventional battery cages. They don't provide any significant welfare benefit over the conventional battery cage. Nevertheless, when the European uh, commit, when the when the Commission in January of this past year said that they were not going to postpone implementation of the directive that that basically everybody had to have enriched cages at least by 2012 compassion and world farming comes out and says this is you know this is wonderful this is great doesn't even bother to say um, you know and by the way um, it, we think that the method that most of the producers are going to use because it's the cheapest method and it's allowed under the directive the method that that most of them are going to use is no better than the conventional cage but but again you know it's a it's a situation where uh, it's a situation where the organizations get to get to uh, uh declare victory and get to say oh well this really shows that that you know uh, the public and animal producers are sensitive to the public's concerns about animal welfare and blah 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 and yet the the, the 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 change the reform if you want to call it that that is going to happen which is going to be the enriched cage because that's the cheapest of the three methods and that's the one that most of the producers are going to use okay is something that the organizations themselves acknowledge does not provide significant improvement of welfare benefit over the conventional cage hmm. so this is really smoke mirrors and entertainment but is what per- it is but professor francione yes People often claim that abolitionism, abolitionism has no incremental strategy. Uh, I mean, we hear it that sure, all the time. It sure does, Bob. Well, I know. <laughs> I know. Veganism. People all, well, exactly. That's what I'm getting at. And, but here's the thing, right? The critique is, is that we ultimately put our own ideology over the everyday suffering of animals, that we're asking too much of people, that veganism is too difficult. And I'm wondering if you can maybe give a, a, a response to that, to those critiques, and how you just said veganism. How do you view veganism as that incremental change? Well, if we're ever going to change any, if we're ever going to change anything, we've got to shift a par- we, we have a paradigm to shift. In other words, we need to get people to stop seeing animals as things and stop regarding them as commodities. And we need to we need to to to, to get people to to understand that if we take animal interests seriously, the first thing we do is we get them off of our plates, and and so yes, abolition does involve an incremental strategy, and that is you go vegan, Jenna goes vegan, I go vegan, Anna goes vegan. We educate everybody that we can to become vegans, and we have more and more and more vegans. Demand does drop if we have more and more vegans. I mean, just think about it for a second. If we took the millions, and I actually think it's probably billions. If we took the billions that we have spent in the United States alone, this is an argument I made in 1980, you know, 86 or 87. Nobody listened to me then either. But I mean, um, if we took the billions of dollars that we have spent on animal advocacy uh, since 1986, and we put that into vegan education, 
really good, clear vegan education, unequivocal vegan education. With naked people or no? No, no naked people. <laughs> no, oh. no, 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 you know, I mean, just straight, clear, creative, nonviolent vegan education. We would now, in 2000, almost, two, well, 2008, I'm going to say almost 2009, but it's not quite, um, but we would, by 2008, have many, many more vegans than we do. And that would be significant, not only for reducing demand, but for forming the foundation of a political movement that was truly an abolitionist movement. We don't have, I mean, to, to call the animal rights movement a movement is a, is, a, is, a, is a misuse of the word movement. It really isn't a, 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 a social movement at all. Um, not, not one that, I, 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 I don't regard it as a social movement at all. I think it's, it's part business, part cult, and not, not, not a whole lot of social movement. <laughs> it's but, incoherent if it is. Yeah, it's, it's exactly. I mean, as a social movement, it, it's absolutely incoherent. Um, but, but, um, but I think that um, if we... You know, if we had done, if we had put that money into vegan education, I think we'd be a lot better off now than we are, where we're using more animals now in more horrific ways than any other point in human history. So, like, where are these people coming up with this idea that re welfare regulation is going to lead to reduced use, welfare regulation is going to lead to abolition? And as far as the comment that you made when, when uh, the, at the outset of your question about people saying, well, you know, we've got to do something now to help the animals, and the answer is, well, what is it that you're doing now to help the animals? You know, I mean... What what is it that that you know? I, I mean, how is this helping the animals? I mean, how is how is um, you know the the European uh, uh, egg battery uh, directive? How is that helping animals? How you know how is how is um, you know the controlled atmosphere killing thing helping animals? It was going to happen anyway. I mean, <laughs> to the extent that it's economically efficient, more and more poultry produce, as you pointed out. You know, the United Egg Producers recommend it as a cost-efficient way of dealing with spent hens in the in the in the uh, the egg laying business. Correct. That's right. All right. So, I mean, it's going to happen anyway. So, I mean, w w what is it that we're doing except reinforcing? See, this is the problem. Welfare reinforces the property paradigm. It reinforces the idea that it's okay for us to use animals, and the only question is how we treat them. And that reinforces the property paradigm. It doesn't get us away from the property paradigm. Sure. What we need to do is get away from the property paradigm. And when people say, well, people aren't going to become vegans, you know what? I I'd like to tell you, and I'm sure this happens with you too, but, but I wish I had a nickel for every email I have gotten over the years, or every letter that I got before we started with email, um, where people say, you know, I've read your stuff, I've really never thought about it that way before. It's absolutely clear that veganism is really the only solution. And, and um, you know, people really can I think it's tremendously negative. I also think it's tremendously elitist to think that, you know, only those of us who are smart enough or good <laughs> enough or whatever can understand you know, the, the, the argument about veganism, it's, it's a very simple argument. Most people do, or many people do, cer certainly um, we have enough we can work with right now. We can worry about, you know, how, how deep the pool goes, but, we, you know, there's a pool there that we haven't really begun to tap, of people who are concerned about animals and are concerned, you know, do think that animals have moral significance, have their own companion animals or have had companion animals and have, have deep feelings about animals and whatnot. Those are people that we should be talking to saying, well, look, That's if right. you care, why are you acting in this morally schizophrenic way? And, and, and eating them, um, you know, whatever else, I mean, you know, the, if, we, if we regard them as members of the moral community at all, then we ought to stop eating them. That, that's, that's the first step. We can worry about, you know, we can talk about the other issues. Should we be using them for, for experiments? No, I don't think that we should. But I think that's a much harder argument. You know, that's, that's a more complicated argument. It is. Mm -hmm. um, that's a more, it requires more, it requires more, uh, it, it requires a, a ramped up argument, in essence. The, where the, where's the argument for animals, for, I mean, there is no argument for, for using animals for food. I mean, right. there's absolutely no, it's a completely frivolous, trivial use of uh, of animals, it results in enormous amounts of suffering and death. It is an absolutely inexplicably unjustifiable practice, 
And people really need to sort of be confronted with that. And I mean confronted, I, when I say confronted, I don't mean in a aggressive way, I mean in a clear way, in a nonviolent way, and in a creative way. And I often get the question, well, you know, what if somebody says to you, I hear what you're saying, and I agree with you, um, and I would like to do it, but I can't do it right away, so therefore I'm going to eat cage-free eggs. And I always say, no, no, no don't do that. You know, there, there's, there's an answer for that. And then the, and the answer, you know, don't, don't, don't go to cage-free eggs. What you should do is, if you really feel, first of all, it's not difficult. You can do it. You can start today. It's easy. Um, it's a lot easier than it, it was when I became a vegan 26 years ago, whatever. Um, but it's very, very easy. But if you feel you can't do it, um, well, let me make a suggestion. Why don't you uh, start with one vegan meal a day? Mm-hmm. Start with breakfast and eat no animal products. You know, not, not, not cage-free eggs, but no animal products whatsoever. No butter, no eggs, no nothing. And then see that you're not going to die and see that, in fact, you can, you can figure out what foods to eat um, without having nutritional deficiencies. And, in fact, it's probably going to even help your health. But, um, you know, see how, see, get used to breakfast. Kind of, you know, get used to vegan breakfast, and then go to vegan lunch, and then go to vegan dinner, and then get them out of your snacking regimen or whatever, and and you know do that if you want to do that in you know three or four steps, do that in three or four steps. But I don't think we should ever be in a position of saying to people that the morally acceptable solution is to eat something that's been made you know in the concentration camp that had color televisions rather than in the one that didn't. And I think it is, it is, to me, obscene that we have people who claim to be animal rights advocates, and I'm, I'm, using, right, I'm, I'm, I'm using that deliberately, you know, they claim to be animal rights advocates, going around to colleges or any place else mm-hmm. and saying to people, you know, eat cage-free eggs. That's, that's a morally acceptable thing to do. And the answer is, I don't think we should ever be in a position of saying something like that. See, I mean, I, I would, if, if somebody says, look, I, I really, I buy the arguments, but I'm not really sure I, I can go vegan right away, I would not say to that person, well, continuing to eat any level of animal products is okay. I would say it's, n- it's never okay. Mm-hmm. If you feel you can't do it, then at least try to do it in stages. I, but I never agree. tell people. The idea that we have, the idea that animal people, that people who consider or call themselves animal rights advocates, are, are going around saying to people, I mean, like Singer, the idea that Singer tells people that being a conscientious omnivore, omnivore is, a, is, a, is a defensible ethical position is, in my judgment, obscene. I, I completely agree with that. And, and interestingly, one of the first moments I had where it really was driven home to me, you know, just how just how horrible the whole new welfareist uh, kind of approach was, was actually in that cage-free campaign. Um, I was actually working, starting to work on one of those cage-free campaigns a number of years ago uh, on, our, on our local campus. And I, I was in the position where I was being asked to provide information to our dining services about cage-free egg producers. And I had this moment where I thought, holy hell, what am I doing? I'm a vegan. I'm opposed to this at its root. Why am I passing on information about cage-free egg producers so that these people can buy more eggs, things that I'm opposed to the production of to begin with? So I completely understand that point. I do want to play devil's advocate a bit, though. I mean, the, the thing that often comes up is that, well, it's akin to kind of negotiating for the rights of prisoners, right? Um, I, and the, one of the examples I've often heard is this, is that there are prisoners in Guantanamo Bay, uh, they are held there unjustly. One can recognize that their imprisonment is unjust, but one could also be the Red Cross and go in and fight for better conditions for those prisoners. That is often the same kind of argument I hear for animals um, under the under the ideas of new welfareism. That okay, look, these are these are simply prisoners of a system. The system is unjust. We're working for abolition, but since we're not going to abolition tomorrow, we need to actually watch out for the interests of those prisoners. How do you respond to that argument? Well, uh, there are a number, number of different responses. First of all, I'm not going to defend what goes on in Guantanamo Bay, or indeed what goes on in non-Guantanamo uh, Guantanamo Bay prisons in the United States. Oh, I agree. In the United States. I'm not going to defend that. But I do think that there's a huge difference between, um, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying we're not violating, we are violating people's rights, and it's horrible, and it's dreadful, and it it's, it's, should be stopped. Um, but I do think that what goes on with animals is qualitatively different in the sense that 
um, even though um, people in, in those settings and in a variety of other settings are abused and exploited, um, the exploitation of non-human animals is qualitatively different because they are property. Um, and, and I think that, that, that there's, there's discrimination and then there's slavery. Discrimination's horrible, but it's different from, it, 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 you know, uh, uh, it's, it, discrimination still exists in the United States of America. It undoubtedly exists on ra- racial discrimination. It's different from slavery. I mean, this is one of the reasons why um, slavery is, is regarded under the laws of every nation and, and as a matter of international law. As a matter of fact, the prohibition against slavery is one of the is is a, is, a, is a rule of customary international law, of which there are very few such rules. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, it it, it 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 bespeaks a sort of a universal agreement that there's that, that slavery is a qualitatively different sort of of of, of harm. Um, and and you know, the, the chattel slavery, and you know, the the idea that um, you know that, that 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 humans are commodities is something that we regard as obnoxious in a way that, that sort of puts it in a separate category. Again, we do all sorts of things we shouldn't do. We discriminate in all sorts of ways we shouldn't discriminate. We do all sorts of terrible things to people. But there is still there's a difference between discrimination and chattel slavery, where all of one's interests, including one's interest in life and in not suffering, and, and all of one's interests basically can have a price tag attached to them and can be sold away depending on whether or not it's in someone else's benefit to do so, someone else's interest, economic interest to do so. And, and I think that, um, you know, the, the, that, that's point number one. I think, I, I think that chattel slavery... Just as chattel slavery represents to us, to, uh, 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 represents to us a qualitatively different sort of harm that, that we put in a category by itself, and that all the, the, the laws of all nations and international law puts in a category by itself, I think that there's, there's that difference, number one. Number two, when you have people who are doing reforms whatever context, whether it's in Guantanamo Bay or whether it's in, you know, anything, you're dealing with situations in which um, people are saying, look, we're not going to end this today. We would like to end it. We think this is terrible. But we are going to, you know, we we think that people ought to be given this particular benefit or that particular benefit in the interim. At least they're making clear what the end point is. Mm -hmm. What really troubles me, about the we- the new welfare movement is that they'll say at conferences, "Oh, we think animal exploitation is terrible." But let me tell you something: if you're not a person who does, you know, if you don't go to you know these these animal conferences, or you're not really reading literature, with literature is all confusing anyway. But I mean, basically, if you're a normal human being who's just reading the newspaper, you come away with the idea that at best the animal people are terribly confused. You don't get the idea that the animal people think that that all animal use is a bad idea and is morally unjustifiable and is moral obscenity. You just don't get that. That's so true. You just just don't get that. But, you know, uh, but again, I mean... You know, I think what's going on in Guantanamo Bay is terrible. I think what goes on in most prisons is terrible. I think what I think the fact that we have, you know, that we're such a rich nation, or we used to be, um, and that we have so many poor people in this country, we have such a level of poverty, and we have such a horrible health care situation. I mean, these are things, they're terrible. I mean, it's just terrible. But I still think that um, that those those injustices, as bad as they are, and as much as I would like to see them rectified, are still very, very different from the commodification of sentient beings and the way and the, and the I mean, look, we do things to animals in the, in the, in, in the best of these new welfare uh, delusional happy havens. I, was it, Eric, I, it was Eric Marcus, I, I think, that, that, um, that described um, uh, the cage-free egg as, uh, you know, the difference between the cage. What, what was, the, what was the, 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 the distinction he made? The was Connecticut between, Minimum Security Prison. Right? Yes, yes. He he said that 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 conventional eggs were uh, were um, like uh, Guantanamo Bay, and and cage free eggs were like a minimum security Connecticut prison or something like that. Is that is that a fair characterization of what he said? I believe it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's my recollection, at least. Um, and so I I certainly think that that's great. I, I think that that's just. I mean, it's it's if it weren't so pathetic, it would be funny. Um, uh, I mean. 
anybody who thinks that cage-free uh, eggs represent any sort of significant welfare improvement over battery eggs has never seen a cage-free facility. They're horrible places. I would urge anybody and everybody who's interested in the question to log on to the Peaceful Prairie website um, and take a look at the free that they have. A, they have a video that they have of 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 hens that came from a free range facility, and take a look at their video equi- at their at their videos. Take a look at their literature, and tell me that cage free eggs are, represent any sort of significant welfare improvement over the conventional battery egg. And I mean, I, I think that that if we look at how we're treating animals under the best situations, free range, cage free, whatever. It constitutes torture of a sort that we don't put any human beings through. And when anybody finds out that we do anything even remotely similar, there's a huge outcry. So I just think that it's, it's just different. I mean, it really is different. And again, I want to emphasize, I'm not in any way uh, denigrating uh, the human rights issues that are pressing, important, and where there's tremendous injustice going on to human beings. I just think our institutionalized exploitation of animals represents something that is torture of the most severe sort um, and um, you know it, 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 the, the sort of thing I mean we really get upset and concerned when we torture people doing things like waterboarding uh, and yet we do things to non-human animals that are far 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 worse than than uh, than waterboarding okay so thank you once again to Gary for spending a lot of time with us talking about his book and talking about veganism and abolitionism and everything. I always like, enjoy hearing him talk about veganism because he's so very animated about it. And he, he is. It just makes you feel really good about you know being a vegan and spreading the vegan word. That's right. And and um, Gary's arguments are so logical. Exactly. I mean, they're, they're so thoroughly logical. Yeah. They just make sense. They do. So. Hope you enjoyed it as well. We'll have the second half, like we said, early next week, hopefully. Yeah. And uh, after that, we'll be back to our regular shows. I think so. We're going to have some more interviews coming up. Yeah. we got some stuff going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got some things in the queue. We do. We're working we do. out. We're working it out. But anyway. Cool. That's it. All right. So, enjoy. Be in touch with us. Show at veganfreakradio.com. If you have any input, uh, you can call our voicemail at 267-295-1944. And we look forward to hearing from you. Yes. Until Talk. next time. Bye-bye. I'm a vegan, 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 I'm